Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Watch podcast series. I'm John Briggs, Global Head of Desk Strategy. This series helps you cut through the noise of global financial markets with a quick take on the upcoming trends to watch. Hello, everyone. This past week saw an increase in concerns about risk assets with stories around specific equities, short seller squeezes, penny stocks, and the like garnering much of the media attention. Underneath all that, though, is a more impactful concern about the durability of earnings, of which we're in the middle of uh, earnings season, and increasingly COVID lockdowns, vaccine distribution, and the corresponding impacts to growth. Clearly, all those items are related. Even before this week, we discussed how we felt the U.S. and the U.K. were showing signs of slowing, or perhaps better said, a loss of momentum into the end of the year. And while the European data has been more resilient, their recent lockdowns have been arguably more severe. In addition, the news this week on the approval of and delivery of vaccines into the euro region were not particularly positive. And as we've noted in the past, so much of the market's valuations, risk assets in particular, are premised on the fact that we have a light at the end of the COVID tunnel. Of course, there's differing expectations on when different economies will emerge from the pandemic, but any lengthening of those timelines makes that light seem dimmer and should have an impact on market valuations. Lastly, there's also rising concerns about the viability of the current vaccines to adequately deal with new COVID variants. So I think it's these considerations, not what's happening to a video game retailer day to day, that has weighed on risk assets of late. This in turn has helped to create a flight to quality bid to the dollar, weighed on emerging markets, and given core fixed income a bid. Will this continue? Well, US earnings season is off to a solid start, so that should help. But developments around the vaccine will continue to be key for the medium term, even if short-term volatility continues. As a reminder, we see Israel, the U.S., and the U.K. leading the way on that front. So that's what's going to, in our view, determine the future for risk assets, despite all of the companies that have been in the headline this week. Speaking of the U.K., I want to now turn to our special guest, Ross Walker, our chief U.K. economist and co-head of global economics. Ross, I want to hone in on the U.K. today because there's been some mixed signals from the data. PMIs and retail sales have been poor, but the December employment data held up. All this as the UK, as we know, in the last few weeks, formalized Brexit deal. So I have a question on each, but let me ask you first, what is your near-term outlook for the UK economy? So the story is that we think the recovery is, is clearly going to be delayed by the third national lockdown, which took effect at the beginning of January is almost certainly going to spill over into most of February, but hopefully by March, we'll begin to get some gradual reopening of of the economy. So the first quarter in a sense is is a write-off. And whereas at the tail end of last year, the Bank of England, most forecasters were looking for relatively sprightly growth, two and a half percent non-annualized quarterly growth, something like that. We're now looking at a similar sized fall in the first quarter. Um, The good news is we think the shock is probably contained, and from that lower base, uh, we see scope for, uh, at least superficially, a a fairly sprightly rebound in the second and third quarters. Okay, so longer term, what are your thoughts? But with a special focus on, you know, not just the scarring that we've seen from, from the COVID pandemic, but from Brexit itself, I mean, even from my U.S. vantage point, I read a lot of articles about queues at the ports, European companies not getting U.K. inputs, you know, that sort of thing. Are the, is this just headline garnering? Is it just temporary adjustments? Or do you think that that is a durable theme? It's obviously still very early days. And I think the the renewed lockdown, not only in the U.K., but also in, in much of continental Europe, um, will have had some uh, affect some distortion on economic activity, trade flows and borders and so on. We, we certainly haven't, the, the evening news bulletins have not been dominated by, by large lorry queues on either side of the, the channel tunnel. But I think one of the interesting things that is beginning to emerge as individual companies drill down into the detail of what the, the trade deal means for their business is that although we often talk in a a slightly sort of broad brush way about, well, we've secured a, a free trade in goods deal, zero tariffs on trade in goods. In reality, it's zero tariffs on trade in qualifying goods. And one of the problems that is arising for a number of companies is uh, the, the rules of origin content requirements. In other words, a lot of UK exports have a big import content and those imports are coming from outside the EU. So 
there are tariffs having to be paid, not only paid, but the administration, the bureaucracy around that. Uh, companies are also reporting higher shipment costs, other bureaucracy. Um, some companies talking about actually, in order for their models, their business models to be sustainable, having to think about new investment uh, in EU locations in order to uh, avoid some of these extra costs um, and, and administration. So I think slowly what we're seeing is some real world complications emerge. And I think one of the, the, uh, the, the themes as we move through this year will be to try and monitor how UK export performance is, is faring. Clearly, I think there will, be, there will be some drag and certainly bigger problems uh, for SMEs who are often less able to, to absorb these costs. Uh, and, and in turn, what that then means for business investment. Our, our own forecasts assume a relatively um, modest contribution, really a flat contribution to GDP growth uh, from net trade. And also we see business investment as, as one of the lagging components of this recovery. So some consumer led boost through late spring and summer, uh, but not so much on the corporate side. So one more, that just doesn't sound necessarily bad enough though to get the Bank of England to go to negative rates, does it? We don't think so. We, we remain quite skeptical on negative rates. And, and really the main reason is if you look at what has happened over the past year or so, as the Bank of England cut interest rates quite extensively, a 65 basis point uh, reduction back in March, 2020, Really, we see almost no pass through at these low levels to, for example, new mortgage products. And this would really be for the UK, really one of the most powerful monetary policy transmission channels. So the pass through seems reduced at these very low rates. And therefore, um, we're skeptical that the Bank of England will conclude, therefore, rates need to go, policy rates need to go even deeper. Um, but we have the, the next big policy meeting on the 4th of February. Uh, the Bank of England is also due at that time to report back on some operational issues. So we are going to get some more information. And, and the key thing I think is going to be around that technical operational readiness report, um, whether policymakers are sounding like um, this is a tool that's, that they're closer to deploying or whether, which I think has been the tone uh, from recent comments, particularly from, from Governor Bailey, that there's still a bit of hesitancy and uh, that they're not really inclined to, to cross that Rubicon and, and move into the more radical territory of, of, of negative rates. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll certainly keep an eye on that for next Thursday when the, the, we get the results of the meeting. And thanks for joining us today. And also remind everyone to please check out our content on podcasts and website, and we'll talk to you next week. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of the Weekly Watch. Please subscribe to our channel to get future episodes. We also encourage you to explore more of our content on our website and other social media channels.